Two and a high chair for smoking. Coming of age in a 1990s restaurant. Chapter 4. The Master Plan. Part 8. It was a shame about Ray. He wasn't a bad sort. He was just a loser. According to his resume, he had worked for years at a similar restaurant. It seemed like a good idea. He would slide into the job easily, like a slice of cheddar in a BLT. But it was not to be. I was in the staff room with him and Amy one day, not long after he started. The boss came in, a forced smile on his face. You worked at Sammy's, right? For three years? What did you do in the kitchen there? I worked in the kitchen, yeah. Ray didn't mince words. But what did you actually make? The boss's smile looked more aggressive now. This and that, all the orders, cooking, you know, yeah. I knew what the boss was getting at. It had been chaos that afternoon. Ray didn't seem to know his way around the kitchen and couldn't even make a simple omelet very well. Damn it, Ray! We can't serve that burger! It's burnt to a crisp! It's okay, yeah, said Ray, scraping off the burned meat with a butter knife. Several damn it rays later, and our friend was relegated to the fryer. I felt for him. Watching the boss grill him about his previous work experience was comical. I could read the boss's face. It said, what the fuck have I done? Tell me what you cooked there, Ray. I want to know because it didn't seem like you could cook anything today. I cooked all the stuff, you know. Pancakes, steaks, burgers, sandwiches, yeah. He pronounced it sandwiches. Oh, come on, Ray. You can do better than that. He quit the following week, unannounced. Just didn't show up for his shift. Wouldn't take calls from the boss, either. His dad came in to pick up his final check for him. What a spineless cockroach. Part 9 The nights were getting colder. The sidewalks and parks were filled with red, orange, and yellow leaves. The autumn rain soaked them to a pulpy mush. The air was filled with the smell. There was something nostalgic about it. Twice a week, I took the bus to college after work. I was taking an evening class called Themes in Modern Literature. I still didn't know what I wanted to major in, but I was quite sure reading novels for four years wouldn't make me more employable. At the restaurant, I accepted resumes all the time from people who had a degree in something. English Lit was a common one. It was both depressing and reassuring. I didn't have the indignity of applying for a job in the mall after finishing a degree or the burden of a student loan debt. But it made me wonder how I would ever get out of restaurant work if school wasn't the answer. What was I going to do with my life besides work in a restaurant? Maybe I would find the answer in Australia. The bus came and I got on. It was half full. Did that make me an optimist? The passengers looked bleak and downbeat. There was a window seat open. I sat down and put my backpack next to me, a passive-aggressive way of telling people I wanted to sit alone. I thought back to the previous week. I had gone to school a bit early to do some studying, decided to get an early dinner. There was a restaurant across the street from the college, a pasta place. It was always an odd feeling when I went into a restaurant. Everything was so familiar. One for smoking or non? Smoking. The hostess brought me to a small table near the window. After she left, I could hear her talking with one of the servers. It was slightly unnerving to hear the same conversation I had probably had at work a million times, only with different voices. Who would get the next table? When was someone getting up from their break? Would they close a section early if it was a slow night? I pulled out a novel from my backpack, The Old Man and the Sea. I had to finish reading it and write an essay on the theme of struggle in the book. For me, reading the story was a struggle. 
I couldn't get into Hemingway. And what can I get for you tonight, sir? I looked up at the server, and we both froze for a moment. Our eyes locked. In our minds was a single, shared question. Where do I know you from? That voice. He sounded confident, like a man on his way up in the world. And then it hit me. The Amway meeting two years ago. He had been the speaker, the veteran of the trade, holding court in his parents' living room. His eyes narrowed. He recognized me. I could feel it. The moment passed, and we both acted like nothing had happened. He took my order, and I handed him the menu. Your meal will be out shortly, sir. He smiled and walked away. Hopefully, he wouldn't spit on my spaghetti. Was he still in Amway, chasing the dream? I considered asking him. Ah, don't do it. That was a different lifetime. He was my server, and I was his customer. That's all we wanted each other to be. I left a decent tip when I left. It was the least I could do. There was nothing of interest to look outside the window, so I read the advertisements that lined both sides of the bus, one by one. <laughs> they knew their audience, that was for sure. There were no ads for yacht rentals or high-priced financial advisors. Instead, the panels displayed pictures of happy shoppers at discount clothing stores or smiling students graduating from vocational programs at small for-profit schools, marketing to the downwardly mobile. One ad was for bankruptcy protection. It showed a black and white picture of a man in a pinstripe shirt. He looked stressed. No, more than that, he looked traumatized. At the bottom were the words, Need help? How had he felt when he bought that shirt, I wondered. Was it a happier time? Did he think it made him look like a man on the move? Or was he already consumed with money problems? In my mind, I turned the picture into a narrative. Little did he know that 1999 on-sale pinstripe shirt would be what he wore as he faced the inevitable, calling a bankruptcy protection phone number he had seen on a bus. Fitting, he thought. My life is destined for the discount rack. There would be no more new shirts, he now knew. He was finished. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, I thought. What was my plan? Find another restaurant? Start waiting tables? I wanted to get out of restaurants, not find a different one. At my age, some people were already starting careers. No, I had to get out. The next ad was for payday loans. <laughs> yeah, the companies that advertised on buses certainly knew their market. Outside, it began to rain. Part 10. Tables 19 and 20 along the rail will have to be non-smoking from now on, said the boss, shaking his head. There are new smoking regulations starting next week. Things are changing. And so they were. Customers still joked about walking to the back of the bus, but the writing was on the wall. Smoking was becoming stigmatized. It was inevitable the government would eventually phase out smoking in bars and restaurants. This was just the first pinch. Only a certain number of tables could be reserved for smoking. Violators would be fined. No one was happy with the changes. Smokers weren't happy to see non-smokers encroaching on their turf. Non-smokers who wanted the rail now had two extra tables but were surrounded by smokers. Don't you have anything closer to non-smoking? The smell is really overpowering. We have a few tables left upstairs. Would you like a booth? No, we want the view. You could see the debate in their mind. Okay, we'll stay here. Could we get a high chair, please? Rules existed to be broken, however. If there were several tables waiting for smoking, 
while there were still tables available and non-smoking, the boss might point to a name on the list and say, Put them at table 20. I didn't argue. It wasn't me that would have to pay the fine if an inspector came up the stairs and started counting the tables. Steve, that next smoking table can go at 19, too. I scooped up the menus. Just following orders. Part 11. Halloween came, and stores put out baskets of candies for kids. Not as fun as going out trick-or-treating, but if you were a kid intent on getting as many candies as you could in as little time as possible, it was not a bad deal. Above the food court, we did not have a basket of candies. If a kid wanted something sweet, one of their parental units could damn well order a dessert and pay for it. In a couple of weeks, the first Christmas decorations would go up. They seemed to go up earlier and earlier every year. This would be my sixth Christmas at the mall. I noticed things like that. Each time I got paid, I threw a sizable chunk of change at my credit card, paying off the debt I had accumulated while dating Erica. It wasn't a lot, and I would be in the clear soon, but I still felt frustrated. There was nothing saved for Australia. I was going to get out of this shithole. It was just going to take a little bit longer than I had expected. After Halloween, there was usually a, a lull before the Christmas rush. That year, however, we were busier than usual. The head office decided it would be a good idea to put coupons in the newspaper to drum up business. It worked. Those two-for-one coupons really brought in the crowds. The expectation was that eaters would come back after acquiring a taste for our menu. Like a dealer passing out samples. First one's free, kid. During a rush, the whole thing became a bit of a shit show. Customers would come up with a bill. Uh, we gave the coupon to the server, but she didn't take off one of the meals. Shit. Of course, it was always a table from smoking, so I had to leave the front, weave my way through the chaos along the rail to the back pass bar and confirm this with the server. Or the table had only ordered one item from the two-for-one list, mistaking a similarly named item for one that was. This left it to me to break the news to the eaters, who looked at me with dismay. They hadn't brought enough cash. My all-time favorite, though, was when customers would waltz out of the place, telling me they had left the coupon, bill, and cash on the table, having done all the calculations themselves. One afternoon, a couple came up to the front. Oh, shoot. We left the coupon on the table, said the woman. I looked at the bill. Two gourmet burgers with fries and two Cokes. Fuck it. I'll get that from the server, don't worry about it, I said. I promoted one of the meals and printed up the new bill. The couple paid, and I went to the back pass bar. Amy, where's the coupon from table 23? Amy blinked. Coupon? Yeah, they said they left a coupon on the table. I don't think there was a coupon on 23. She gave me a funny look. I checked the table. It had been cleared already. Nothing on the chairs or under the table. It hadn't fallen off. Something wasn't right. I checked the garbage bin, sifting around a bit. Maybe it had accidentally been scooped up with a placemat? Nope. Shit, we've been scammed, I thought to myself. The boss is going to notice this. Who'll get stuck with the bill? Me or Amy? I considered saying something to the boss, but decided against it. He never mentioned anything. Odd, I thought. I started paying a little more attention to the coupons. They weren't being counted, at least not carefully. They were supposed to be collected at the end of each day, but there was no way to keep track. Of course, some coupons did get lost. 
A few inevitably fell under the tables or accidentally got thrown out somehow. If the boss counted 19 coupons in the cash register, but the computer listed 20 dishes as pro mode, there was no way to know which meal was missing a coupon. I suspected he didn't really think about it. Too much of a headache. The couple might have scammed us, but there was no way of knowing. I had just promoted the meal, which meant the cash register was not missing any money, just a coupon. If the coupons weren't being counted... And then it came to me, clear as day. It was technically theft. If caught, I would get fired, and it was dangerous. But if I was careful, no money would be missing from this cash register. And I could save money for Australia much faster. I wanted to get out of that shithole. But was I a thief? Part 12. And how was everything? The evening had started quietly. Servers contemplated closing upstairs early and sending someone home. Time passed slowly and someone griped about the day's tips. Then the flood started. Eaters kept coming in, wave after wave, a deluge. And after everyone was seated and the orders put in, we reached the eye of the storm, quiet. One by one, the orders came out. People ate, got their bill, and started to leave. First a trickle, then a torrent. As they came to the front, forming a line, I asked each table the same question. And how was everything this evening? One ugly, dissatisfied face after another waited their turn to tell me it had been subpar. They all had their reasons. The food was cold. They'd waited a long time. The cooks had forgotten that they didn't want mayo on their burger. The soup was too salty. One after another, they complained, and one at a time, I apologized, and then asked the next person the same thing. I felt like a prize fighter telling his opponent, again, hit me again, harder. Near the end, a table softened the blow. They felt sorry for me. Hate to be the next one to say this, but we ate it ages for our food tonight and it was cold. But it's not your fault. A man and a woman, the last customers in line, smiled vaguely and shrugged their shoulders. Everything was fine, I guess. Thank God for small favors. They paid in cash and left. I looked at the screen. The bill was listed, the total tabulated, and the change calculated. One more button to push. Settle. Australia. I hesitated for a moment, contemplating what I should do, and then I pushed cancel. I looked quickly over the wooden barrier that separated the cash register from the tables along the rail. The servers were cleaning tables. The boss had gone home. I was alone. I tapped a few buttons on the screen. Voila! One of the items disappeared from the bill. The couple had ordered two items from the two-for-one list, but hadn't known about the deal. Or they had forgotten. Whatever. The cash register was now up $7. A new bill came up from the printer, which I balled up and threw in the trash. I took the money from the till, looked around once more, and then slipped it into my pocket. I could feel a thousand eyes on me. Had anyone seen me? On the walk home that night, I pushed aside my conscience and concentrated on logistics. Each shift, I could promo two, possibly three dishes and come away clean. Minimal risk. 15 to $20. 80 to $100 a week. I'd have to be careful. If I did it too often, boss might notice the difference between the number of coupons and the promoed meals. 
Was he counting? I didn't think so, but it was safer to assume that he was. You're not a thief, I told myself. The boss takes all those tip-out envelopes from the servers and gives you a pittance. He's pocketing the rest. You know he is. You're just taking back what's yours. I would pay off my credit card and start saving again for Australia. I wouldn't get greedy. I would be careful. Part 13. Fran came up the stairs and waited for the boss. I said hi. She smiled nervously. I had heard through the grapevine her family was going to lose their home. Money troubles. She had called the boss and begged him to hire her back. He'll do it, said Lori. He acts tough and he gets angry in the kitchen, but he's a softy deep down. The boss came up to the front and they went upstairs to a booth. He had some papers in his hand. They sat far enough from the front pass bar that we couldn't hear their conversation through the wall. The boss, unlike some customers, knew that it wasn't soundproof. It didn't matter. Word spread around the restaurant before Fran had even finished talking with him. The boss would hire her back, but there would be conditions. His word was the law. There would be no arguing when it came to scheduling or deciding who would work which sections. She also had to serve whatever tables were seated in her section without complaint. That included mall rats and Asians. Finally, she was told to stop singing. The boss made the announcement the next day. Fran was back. Christmas had come early. After a week or two, it was like she had never left. She kept to the conditions in the contract, for the most part. She didn't complain, at least not loudly, when given a shift that she didn't like. She served all customers with a smile, and only cursed them in whispers from the safety of the pass bar. But slowly, the singing came back. That voice. She couldn't help it. It just came out. And most of us didn't mind. Two out of three wasn't bad. Part 14. Christmas again. My credit card debt was history, and I was dipping my fingers into the till almost daily, building up my savings and not feeling the slightest twinge of guilt. Happy holidays! The never-ending shifts, though, ate away at my sanity. Everyone had their limits. Mine came at the two-week mark. Even sleep was not an escape. I went to bed and dreamt of the restaurant. Incidents from work tormented me in my slumber. The worst was lying in bed, trying to sleep, but unable to switch it off. My mind was too wired to rest. It would replay moments over and over like a tape loop. A problem had to be solved, a table had to be seated, a customer was unhappy, I had to get the boss, a server asked me to get drinks for her table but I couldn't get away from the front. Whatever it had been, as soon as I solved the problem, I found myself back at the beginning, on constant repeat, like Sisyphus, pushing a rock up a hill, only to have it slip away at the last moment and roll back down. The days ran together, a blur of tables, faces, dishes, and the smell of bus tubs. The Christmas decorations, red and green and plastic, were everywhere. They decorated the halls. They decked the halls. The mall was awash with holiday music and people with bags, bags, and more bags. The food court was always packed. Doug was there almost every day. Alone, but not alone. A holiday grin on his face. His arms stretched out across the back, the bench backrest, talking to an invisible Santa Claus about the Elvis movie that he wanted for Christmas. I assumed he had a VCR. But things weren't bad. Yes, I was four years out of high school and still working at the mall. 
No, I didn't have a clue what I would do when I finally escaped its clutches. However, I had a steady job. There were opportunities for extra income. I got good exercise at work. I was saving money and had a rock solid goal Australia. I enjoyed cursing the consumerism and laughing at the tacky holiday decorations. But down deep, where I wasn't likely to admit it, I kind of liked it. All of it. People seemed to be doing well. They had money, or at least credit, to buy things. The economy was doing okay. If Christmas decorations hadn't started going up by mid November, I would have missed them. I just wouldn't have admitted it. The mall had a buzz going in December. Even the goths in the food court didn't look as dour. The homies, too, wearing the same jackets they had in July, didn't look as surly. They huddled together for warmth. Of course, there was no handicapped access, still, and infants in high chairs were still choking in the smoking section. And our love of all things plastic was slowly adding to global environmental problems. But all that would be solved later. And if not solved, then addressed. Acknowledged at the very least. We would get there. We would. Christmas was a time of hope.